You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. Lecture 7, given on August 28, 1919 by Rudolf Steiner. Lecture Cycle, Practical Advice to Teachers. In the beginning, you will face certain difficulties in teaching that your school, by its very nature, will share with rural schools. Urban schools today do not have especially good methods, and whatever might have been valuable in them is often spoiled by far-fetched ideas. But they do have the advantage of being well equipped with teaching aids, particularly for physics, chemistry, and natural history. It is the same in primary schools as it is in secondary schools and scientific institutes. While the town schools have poorer methods and better equipment, the country schools still, if their teachers have not been spoiled in training in a town before being posted to the country, sometimes have the better teaching methods, even though they are less well equipped with teaching aids. We should not, however, ignore the goodwill of new teachers in urban schools to find good methods. Those who are seeking to come to grips with the problems and attitudes of our time have no laboratories and experimental equipment at their disposal, whereas those who are better equipped at universities and other institutions apply the least fruitful scientific methods. This state of affairs has existed for a long time in the scientific world. One cannot help wondering, for instance, what might not have grown out of Schopenhauer's philosophy, which is now no more than a kind of philosophical dilettantism, if Schopenhauer had had all the means at his disposal that a professor of a few years standing at a university has today. Print, uh, footnote, Arthur Schopenhauer, 1788 to 1860, a German philosopher expounded a doctrine of pessimism and irrational impulses arising from the will. End of footnote. How little of the Schopenhauer spirit is evoked these days by university professors who otherwise have sufficient means at their disposal. You will often have to rely on your powers of invention and fall back on simple devices in situations for which city schools have plenty of equipment. This may be just what you need to make your teaching really lively, but in some instances it will also detract from your pleasure in your work. You will feel this to be particularly true when the children have reached the age of nine when it is hardly possible to present the right kind of lessons without proper equipment. You will have to substitute drawings or simple primitive paintings in all sorts of circumstances, where under ideal circumstances you would use the object itself in your lesson. I have made this preliminary observation because today I want to speak to you about the transition in teaching method that must be made, particularly carefully, when the children approach their ninth year. We will not understand the curriculum until we have schooled our educational capacity sufficiently to perceive the being of the child between the seventh and fifteenth years of life. I would like to show you as teachers what you will have to apply in your lessons at the point when the children reach the age of nine to ten years. Of course you will present it in a more elementary way that they can understand. The point in question is reached by some children before the age of nine and by others later, but on average what I want to tell you about today starts with the ninth year. When this period in the children's lives draws near, it will be necessary to introduce the subjects of natural history into the lessons. Before this time, natural history is presented in a narrative form, as I described yesterday in our seminar when I spoke about the relationship of the animal and plant worlds to the human being. Footnote Discussion 6 in Discussions with Teachers, shortly to be on this website. End of footnote. We use a narrative, descriptive form when we introduce natural history to the children early on, but we cannot start giving proper lessons on natural history before they have reached the age of nine. It is enormously important to know that the aim in teaching the children about natural history will be completely subverted if we do not start these natural history lessons by describing the human being. You may say quite rightly that there is not much you can tell nine-year-old children about the natural history of the human being. But however little it may be, you must present it to them as a preparation for all your other natural history lessons. When you give such lessons, you must be clear 
that the human being represents a synthesis, a bringing together of the three kingdoms of nature, that the three kingdoms of nature are united in the human being at a higher level. You will not have to say this explicitly to the children, but during the course of your lessons you must give them a feeling for how the human being is a synthesis of all the other kingdoms of nature. You will achieve this aim if, in the way you treat the subject of the human being, you awaken in the children the impression of the human being's importance within the scheme of universal order. Perhaps you will start by describing the human being's external appearance to the nine-year-olds. You will draw their attention to the principal division of the human being into head, trunk, and limbs. In doing so, you will also have to take account of the external appearance, the external form. You will do well to make use of drawing, which you have already practiced with the children, to conjure up for them an idea of the main parts of the human form. You will show them that the head is round like a ball, that it is somewhat flattened on the underside where it rests on the trunk and is thus a ball perched on the trunk. It is helpful to give the children a picture like this. It awakens simultaneously the feeling and the will element, for they begin to see the head artistically from the point of view of its spherical shape. This is important. You appeal in this way to the child as a whole and not only to the intellect. Then you try to awaken in the children the idea that the trunk is a fragment of the head. You can do this by drawing and saying that the head is round like a ball. If you take a piece out of the round ball, the shaded part of the drawing, and this is really looks like a, 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 a moon with uh, showing the hidden part and then the, the crescent, and then the crescent is pulled out and lowered underneath, and so you've got a full circle above, and the crescent is sort of hinged into it. Let me read that again. If you take a piece out of the round, round ball, the shaded part of the drawing, by cutting it off and keeping what remains, so that you have what looks like the moon left over from the sun, you have the basic form of the trunk. It would be a good idea to make a round ball out of wax or kneaded dough and then cut off the shaded part so that you have the shape of the moon as it arises from the sphere. With this method, you could really call forth in the children the picture of the human trunk as a fragment of a sphere. And for the limbs, you must awaken the idea that they are appended to the trunk. There will be much the children cannot understand, and yet you will rouse the strong impression that the limbs are added on to the human organism. At this stage, you should not go on to explain that the limbs extend into the body as a morphological potential linked there with the sexual and digestive organs which simply continue the limbs inwardly. But you must certainly rouse most strongly in the children the idea that the limbs are inserted into the organism from the outside. You will have given the children a first conception of the human form. <clears throat> Next you should awaken the idea, however elementary and primitive, that our faculty of looking at the world is bound up with the sphere of our head. You can say to the children, quote, Your eyes, your ears, your nose, and your mouth are all in your head. You see with your eyes, you hear with your ears, you smell with your nose, and you taste with your mouth. Most of what you know about the outside world you know through your head. Unquote. If you expand on this idea, the children will gain a concept of the special formation and task of the head. <clears throat> then you instill in them an idea of the trunk by saying, quote, What you taste with your tongue goes down into your trunk as food. What you hear with your ear goes into your trunk as sound. Unquote. It is good to create in the children the idea of the whole constellation of the organs in the human being. Indicate to them that in their chest they have organs for breathing, and in their abdomen they have their stomach for digesting. Next you do well to let the children consider how the human being's limbs, in the form of feet, serve for walking, and in the form of hands can move and work freely. It is helpful that the children can come to an understanding of the difference between the way the feet and arms serve human beings. The feet serve by carrying human beings' bodies about and enabling them to go to the different places where they live and work. This activity stands in contrast to that of the arms and hands with which human beings do not have to carry the body, but with which they can instead work freely. While the feet are planted on the ground, the hands can be stretched out into the air so that they can work. In short, quite early on, the children should be made aware of the essential difference between human legs and feet and human arms and hands. There is a distinction 
between the service rendered by feet and legs when they carry the body and that, and that rendered by the hands and arms that do not work for the body but for the world. This difference between the egoistic service of the feet and the selfless service of the hands that work for the human being's environment should be made clear to the children at an early age through their feelings. By letting the concept arise out of the form, we teach the children as much as possible about the natural history of the human being. And only then do we continue with the rest of natural history, first to the animal kingdom. No doubt you will have to contrive some sort of substitute, but it would be ideal if you could bring to the classroom a cuttlefish, a mouse, a lamb, or a horse, or some other mammal, and some sort of image of the human being. Of course, you will have to plenty of human specimens for all you need do is name one of the children and present this child to the others when you want the human being to be the object of their study. You must be quite clear about how you will proceed. First, you will seek to familiarize the class with the cuttlefish. You will tell them how it lives in the sea and show them what it looks like, either by bringing a live one into the classroom or by making drawings. In short, you will introduce the cuttlefish to the children. When you describe it to them, they will feel that you are doing it in a particular way. They may not notice till much later, perhaps when you describe the mouse to them, how differently you treat the subject of the mouse from that of the cuttlefish. You must try to develop an artistic feeling in the children, so that in the way you set about describing the cuttlefish quite differently from the manner in which you describe the mouse, <clears throat> you also give them a certain feeling for the difference between these two animals. You must hint at the nature of the cuttlefish by showing how it feels what surrounds it, if it senses danger, it at once emits its dark juice, enveloping itself in a kind of aura to divert the attention of the approaching enemy. You can tell the children all sorts of things to help them understand. You will show them that whatever the cuttlefish does, perhaps when protecting itself from its enemies in some way or when it eats, <clears throat> it does it in the same way that human beings act when they eat or interact with the world. When human beings eat, they experience a taste a feeling that is communicated through the tongue, the organ of taste. And the human eye, E-Y-E, feels the constant need to look into the light. By doing this, the eye comes to grips with light. Because the human being's organs of taste want to taste, they, ser they take in what serves as food. You should describe the cuttlefish in a way that gives the children a feeling for its sensitivity, its delicate perception of the things around it. You will have to work out an artistic description that will act really help the children grasp the cuttlefish. Then you describe the mouse, giving a picture of its pointed snout and how clearly visible are the whiskers on this pointed snout and the gnawing teeth protruding from the lower and upper jaws. You describe its disproportionately large ears and then come to the cylindrical body with its fine velvety coat of hair. Next you describe its limbs, the smaller forefeet and the somewhat larger hind feet that allow the mouse to jump well. It also has a scaly tail that is less hairy. You show the children that if the mouse wants to climb or grasp with its forepaws, it supports itself with this tail. The tail is very useful because it is more sensitive inwardly owing to its scaly surface, lacking hair. Once again you describe the mouse to the children by artistically building up its forms. You will succeed in this artistic construction if you awaken in the children the notion that for all the functions for which the cuttlefish does not need appendages attached to its bodies, the mouse needs such appendages. The cuttlefish is sensitive in itself, through its body, and it does not need large ears like the mouse. Its relationship to its environment allows it to take in nourishment without the help of a pointed snout, and it does not need the large limbs of the mouse because it uses its body to propel itself along in the water. Sum up in detail what you want to impart to the children in this artistic way, namely that the cuttlefish manifests itself not through limbs, but through the body itself. <clears throat> I have to describe all this to you so that you can translate it into teaching, for you must become conscious of what you have to bring more unconsciously into the lessons you prepare artistically. You must describe the mouse in a way that gradually awakens in the children the feeling that the mouse is organized in such a way that the limbs serve the life of the trunk. Make it clear to the children that the lamb, too, is organized so that the limbs can serve the trunk, just as the horse living in the wild is also. For instance, you can show the children how the mouse must have very pointed and sharp teeth, 
otherwise it would not be able to gnaw at objects as it must in order to nourish itself or even bore holes to live in. With so much gnawing it keeps wearing down its teeth, but like our nails its teeth continually grow from within, so that the mouse constantly replaces its tooth substance. This is particularly particularly noticeable in the teeth, which are, after all, also organs that are appended to the rest of the organism and are formed in a way that enables the mouse's trunk to live. In this way you have awakened in the children through their feelings a clear, though elementary, picture of the cuttlefish and a clear picture of the structure of the mouse. Now you return to the form of the human being. You make clear to the children that if we were to select the part of the human being that is most like the cuttlefish, we would, curiously enough, find that this is the head. The part of the human being most like the cuttlefish is the head. It is bias that keep, causes people to imagine that their heads are the most perfect part of themselves. It is certainly structured in a most complicated way, but it is really just a metamorphosed cuttlefish, a metamorphosed lower animal. The relationship of the human head to its environment is similar to that of the lower animals to theirs. With the trunk, the human being is most like the higher animals, such as the mouse, the lamb, and the horse. But whereas the cuttlefish can entirely maintain its life through its head, the human being cannot. A human being's head must be set on top of the trunk and rest there. It cannot move about freely. The cuttlefish, however, is fundamentally an entire head and nothing else, and it moves about freely in water. You will have to make sure that the children gain a feeling for the fact that the lower animals are heads moving about unhindered, though they are as yet not as perfect as human heads. <clears throat> then you must awaken in the children the understanding that the higher animals are mainly trunks and have skillfully formed their organs out of nature so that these organs can chiefly serve the needs of the trunk. This is much less true with human beings. They are less perfect in the trunk than are the higher animals. Then we must arouse in the children a sense for what is most perfect excuse me, for what is the most perfect part of the human being's external form. The human being is most perfect in the limbs. If you follow the sequence of the higher animals up to the apes, you will find that the fore limbs are not so very different from the hind limbs and that the main function of all four is to carry the trunk, move about with it, and so on. This marvelous differentiation of the limbs into feet and hands, legs and arms, happens only in the human being. It expresses itself in the predisposition to walking upright and having a vertical posture. No animal species is so perfectly structured as the human being with regard to the complete organization of the limbs. <clears throat> Here you could introduce a really vivid description of the human being's arms and hands. They have no part in carrying the organism. The hands do not touch the earth with regard to anything to do with the body, and they have been transformed in a way that enables them to grasp objects and undertake work. Then you move on to the moral element, which has to do with the will. Awaken in the children through their feelings, not in theory, a strong picture. Quote, you can, for example, pick up a piece of chalk with your hand in order to write. You can do this only because your hand has been transformed to enable it to work instead of carrying the body. An animal cannot be lazy about its arms because it does not really have any. When we speak of an ape as a four-handed creature, it is an inaccurate way of talking, because the ape really has four arm-like legs and feet, and not four hands. Even though these creatures are structured for the purpose of climbing, this really serves only the body. Their feet have been shaped like hands, so that in climbing they can support the body. The human being's hands and arms have become useless to the human body, and this is externally the most beautiful symbol of the human being's freedom. There is no more wonderful symbol of human freedom than these arms and hands. Human beings can work for the environment with their hands, and since they eat and nourish themselves, they can also work for themselves out of their free will. Unquote. <clears throat> By describing the cuttlefish, the mouse, the lamb, the horse, and the human being, we gradually kindle in the children a strong sense of the fact that the character of the lower animals is head-like, that of the higher animals is trunk-like, and that of the human being is limb-like. It only inculcates conceit in people if they are constantly taught that human beings are the most perfect beings on earth by virtue of their head. This idea causes people 
unwittingly to absorb the idea that the human being is perfect through laziness, through lethargy. Instinctively they know that the head is a lazy bones, resting on the shoulders, not wanting to move about in the world, but letting itself be carried by the limbs. It is not true that it is through the head, the lazy bones of a head, that human beings are perfect beings. They are perfect in their limbs, which are involved in the world and its work. You make a person inwardly more moral by saying not that he or she is perfect by virtue of the lazy bones of a head, but that he or she is perfect through the active limbs. Those creatures that are only beings of head and have to move themselves like the lower animals, and the creatures that can use their limbs only in the service of the trunk, like the higher animals, are all less perfect compared with the human being. They all use their limbs less freely than can the human being. Their limbs have only a certain purpose, namely to serve the trunk. With the human being, however, one pair of limbs, the hands, is fully situated in the sphere of human freedom. <clears throat> you can instill into human beings a healthy feeling for the world only if you awaken in them the idea that they are perfect because of their limbs and not because of their head. You can do this very well through the comparative description of the cuttlefish, the mouse, the lamb or the horse, and the human being. You will also realize that you should never exclude the human being when you describe activities in any of the kingdoms of nature, because in the human being all the activities of nature are united. We should always keep the human being in the background when we describe anything in nature. This is also the reason why we must take the human being as our starting point when we teach the children about natural science after they reach, reach the age of nine. If you observe the human being in the early years, you will find that something occurs around the age of ten or eleven. It is not as obvious as the first step of this process which took place in early childhood. When children start to move their limbs with more awareness, when they begin to walk even clumsily, when they start to use their arms and hands purposefully, this is when they first become aware of the I capital. The memory will later teach excuse me, the memory will later reach back to this point, but not beyond. When you hear the child say start to say capital I you will realize the beginning of self awareness in a way that is clearly noticeable. Though it may happen a little later, there are individual variations because intentional speech must first develop. The change in the children's self awareness grows stronger at the age of nine and you will find that they understand much better what you say about the difference between the human being and the world. Before they reach the age of nine, the children merge far more thoroughly with the environment than is the case later, when they begin to distinguish themselves from their surroundings. Then you will find that you can begin to talk a little about matters of the soul, and that they will not listen with such a lack of understanding as they would have listened earlier. In short, the children's self-awareness grows deeper and stronger when they reach this age. If you come to understand such things, you will notice that at this age the children begin to use words in a much more inward way than before, becoming more aware that words arise from within. <clears throat> Today people are concerned far more about external than internal phenomena, and consequently they pay far too little heed to the change that occurs in the ninth or tenth year, but teachers must pay attention to it. As a result, they will be able to speak to the children with quite a different fundamental mood if they put off the teaching of natural history, which should always compare human beings with the other kingdoms of nature, until after this transition. While the children are still more integrated with nature, we can speak to them about the subjects of natural science only in a narrative form. After the ninth year, we can present them with the cuttlefish, the mouse, the lamb or the horse, and the human being, and it is then permissible to speak of the relationship of the animal's form to the human form. Before this period in their lives, the children would not be able to comprehend you if you were to connect the cuttlefish to the head aspect and the mouse to the trunk, while also finding in human beings' limbs the element that raises them above the other kingdoms of nature. You ought really to make use of what this special age of the children offers you, because if you apply natural science lessons in the way I have described, you will implant into their souls moral concepts that are very firm and do not falter. You cannot instill moral concepts into the children by appealing to their intellect. You have to appeal to their feeling and their will. 
You will engage the feeling and the will if you guide the children's thoughts and feelings to an understanding of how they themselves are fully human only when they use their hands for working in the world. You must also show them how it is through this activity that the human being is the most perfect creature. You must describe the relationship between the human head and the cuttlefish, between the human trunk and the mouse, lamb or horse. By placing themselves in the natural order of things in this way, the children absorb feelings that later help them understand themselves as human beings. You can implant this particularly important moral element in the, into the children's souls if you try to shape the natural history lessons in a way that will give them no clue that you want to teach them a moral lesson. But you will not be able to imbue them with even a trace of anything moral if you teach natural history as something separate from the human being. If you describe the cuttlefish, the mouse, the lamb of the horse, or even the human being in isolation, it would be nothing but a set of definitions. You can characterize the human being only by building the picture of the human being from all the other organisms and functions in nature. Schiller admired in Goethe the way his conception of nature led him to build up the human being in a naive manner out of all the separate aspects of nature. He expressed this admiration in the beautiful letter he wrote to Goethe at the beginning of the 1790s. I have mentioned this letter repeatedly because it contains an idea that ought to be absorbed into our culture, consciousness of the synthesis of all nature in the human being. Goethe again and again says that the human beings stand at the summit of nature and there feel themselves to be a whole world of nature. He also says that the rest of the world reaches an awareness of itself in the human being. If you read what I have written, you will find that over and over again I have included such quotations from Goethe. I did not quote them because I found them pleasing, but because such ideas must be absorbed into the consciousness of our age. This is why it grieves me so much that one of the most important educational writings has remained virtually unknown or at least bears no fruit in the educational field. Schiller learned, a good ed- learned, excuse me, Schiller learned good educational principles from Goethe's naive self-education and he poured these educational principles into his Aesthetic Education of Man, footnote, th- on the Aesthetic Education of Man, Oxford University Press, New York, 1992, and a footnote, Much that is fruitful for education is contained in these letters, if only we can think beyond them and extend the ideas to their logical conclusions. Schiller arrived at his views through Goethe's vision. Just recall how Goethe, being, as it were, a representative of civilization, implanted into nature, opposed the educational principles of his environment from earliest childhood. He could never bring himself to separate the human being from the environment. He always looked at the human being in relationship to nature, and he felt that, as a human being, he was one with nature. That is why he disliked his piano lessons, so long as they were conducted in a way that disassociated them from a relationship with the human being. He started to take an interest in these lessons only when he was shown the functions of the different fingers. He took an interest when he was told, quote, this is Tommy Thumb, and this is Peter Pointer, unquote, and shown how Tommy Thumb and Peter Pointer were used for playing the piano. He always wanted the whole of the human being to be embedded in the whole of nature. You will remember something else that I've mentioned. When I was seven, Goethe built himself an altar, excuse me, when he was seven, Goethe built himself an altar to nature. He took his father's music stand and placed on it plants from his father's herbarium and minerals and crowned it all with a little incense candle that he lit by focusing the beams of the morning sun with a magnifying glass. This was an offering to the great God of nature, a rebellion against everything imposed on him by education. In the very essence of his nature, Goethe was always a human being longing to be educated in the way people ought to be educated today. And it was because Goethe became this sort of person, after he had schooled himself accordingly, that he appealed so much to Schiller, who then wrote as he did about education in his aesthetic letters. My old friend and teacher, Schroer, once told me how, when he was a teacher, he had had to sit on a school commission to test prospective teachers. Footnote, Carl Julius Schroer, 1825 to 1900, literary historian, professor at the school Steiner attended in Vienna, see an autobiography, chapters in the course of my life, 1861 to 1907, page 42. 
and forward. <clears throat> and a footnote. He had been prevented by circumstances from preparing the examination. Instead, he asked the prospective teachers questions about Schiller's aesthetic letters. They knew all about all sorts of things, Plato and so on, but when Schroer started to question them about Schiller's aesthetic letters, they rebelled. Soon the whole of Vienna knew that Schroer had asked questions about Schiller's aesthetic letters in the teachers' examinations. Nobody can understand what they were about. No one could possibly grasp such things. If we are looking for really healthy ideas on education, even rudimentary ideas, we cannot do without returning to such examples as Schiller's aesthetic letters, and also, for instance, to Jean-Paul's educational doctrine Levana, L-E-V-A-N-A, footnote Jean-Paul, 1763-1825, to born Jean-Paul Friedrich Richter, German writer of novels and romances, and on educational philosophy, Levana, Patriotism and Politics. And a footnote. This work, too, contains an immense number of practical teaching suggestions. More recently, matters have improved to a certain extent, but it cannot be said that the kind of impulse that could come from Schiller's aesthetic letters and Jean Paul's teachings has passed over unadulterated into modern teaching practice. I have attempted to give you an idea of how you can read from a certain period in a child's life. Let me read that again. I have attempted to give you an idea of how you can, quote-unquote, read from a certain period in a child's life at about the age of nine what is best done in terms of education at this time. Tomorrow we shall discuss how we can teach the children what is best suited to their being at the ages of fourteen and fifteen. In this way we shall approach an understanding of the way the whole period from seven to fifteen is structured and what we as teachers and educators should do. The curriculum is built on such considerations. People today often put the question in the abstract. How can we develop the child's capacities? But we must be quite clear that you first have to know the capacities of the growing individual before the abstract statement that these capacities must be developed can have any concrete meaning. The end of Lecture 7